was pregnant with my uh, youngest daughter and we were thrilled because there had been years of infertility and also two ectopic pregnancies. So it was a very wanted pregnancy. And we also had a toddler who was about 18 months old. I'd had just one visit to the OBGYN. Everything was looking great. I was only 10 weeks pregnant. So end of that first trimester. But I was noticing two things didn't seem right to me. And I was having this terrific heartburn, uh, which was very surprising to me so early in the pregnancy. So I'd called the doctor's office several times and they said, well, every pregnancy is different and take my Lanta. That's safe to take in pregnancy. Um, so I did um, by the boatload um, and it was not helping. And the second thing that was happening was I was having this recurring vivid dream and I didn't know it was a precognitive dream because I didn't know what those were. So in the dream, it was always the same. It was this terrible um, storm at sea and I would see um, all these winches um, and cleats. Everything was tearing off this big ship the mass would all fall, the ship would break in two, and it would go down. And I didn't realize that was <laughs> very directly, my ship was about to go down, but I didn't understand um, what, it, what it was trying to tell me. And I was working at home and I just could not get comfortable. I was the only one at home. And my husband was at work with one car. Our nanny was at the park with our toddler with the other car could not get comfortable. So I try and lie down. I try, I go in the bathroom. I'm like, what is wrong here? Just cannot focus. And all of a sudden I have this feeling of impending doom, which I have never had in my life before or since. So I went into the bathroom thinking I'm going to be sick. Something's really wrong here. And Instead, I got this searing pain in my abdomen. It was so bad. I looked down because I really thought there was a knife stuck in me and I felt like something burst and I passed out on the floor. Um, I was fortunate because I didn't get hurt falling because I was kind of crouching down going, I think I need to go for the toilet here because <laughs> I felt so, so much pain and so weird. So I, I am completely passed out on the floor and I came to only because there was this insistent male voice and he kept saying, Wendy, Wendy, you've got to wake up. You have to call for help now or you're going to go home. And I knew exactly what he meant. So I'm laying on my side um, and I'm looking up and it was, it was the shock of my life because the whole bathroom was lit up with this immense light and there were four or five angels and they were just huge. It's like they were like eight or nine feet tall and there was so much light from them. It was incredible. And my mind was blown because I, I was a casual Christian, but to me, angels were like a lovely theoretical possibility. I wasn't really sure that they existed. You know, they're beautiful in art and on um, Christmas cards. And I wanted to believe, but this, this, there was no arguing with. My bathroom was filled with angels. <laughs> so I looked at him when he repeated that message, you've got to call for help now. And I said, I, 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 I can't walk. I, I, I don't know how to get to the phone. And his answer was very interesting. He said, you just have to be willing to try. And I think that was um, implying um, free will. You know, we, we've got to, we've got to ask for help because I did call out for help as I went down. And also we've got to be willing to, to do our own work and put in effort, even when it feels impossible. So I got up on my hands and knees was all I could manage. And once I did that, it's like I was gently picked up and flown the little bit of distance to get to the landline because I'm in the master bath and the, the landline is on the nightstand in the master bedroom. It's before cell phones were glued to our hands. So <laughs> call for help meant get to a phone. 
And I did take one second to think, who should I be calling? He, the, the Archangel, who I later recognized and learned was Archangel Michael, just had said call for help. So I didn't call 911 because he didn't say to do that. And I'd never called 911 in my life. If there was ever a time to call 911, that would have been it. But I called my husband and that was reasonable because he worked five minutes from home and miracles continued because I actually got him on the phone at work. That has never happened before or since. Synchronicity. And I give him, I give him a lot of credit because all I said was, I need you to come home immediately. I need you to drive me to the hospital now. Can you do that? And all he said was on my way. And I heard him throw the phone down. So we get to the, we get to the doctor's office and they whisk me up to their office straight into an ultrasound room. And the ultrasonographer, um, she tries, she's like trying to adjust the picture. And all I can see on the screen is black which didn't make any sense to me. I'd had ultrasounds before. I mean, you're seeing organs, that's the whole point. So I asked her, I says, is your machine working? Is it on? And all she said, she just touched my shoulder and she said, I'm gonna go get the doctor now. Mm. So they're discussing, do we do surgery right now, but we don't have blood. So we decide, wait and watch. And I, I can't get out of the bed. I have to just stay in the bed. And I am in so much pain um, I'm just whipping through all the pain relievers they're trying, and I'm still writhing on the bed. So finally, I'm at the point where they had to put a morphine drip on me um, while we're waiting for the blood. I'm like, ah, oh, but I'm pregnant. I don't want morphine. But we, we just did not have a choice. And they were able to get blood, but it was probably about um, a six or eight hour uh, delay until that happened. So uh, that was that was what what kicked it kicked it all off. I know I'm walking between worlds because I'm having a lot of trouble staying conscious and just want to sleep, just want everyone to leave me alone. And I could feel myself giving up in a way I've never given up in my life. So I agreed to the surgery and we scheduled it for the next morning. It was going to be my own OBGYN, which I was really happy about. In the hospital, I was very fortunate because it was my local hospital, but they were delivering about 5,000 babies a year. And I'm trying to relax that night after dinner. You know, you get your dinner promptly at four o'clock, you're in the hospital. <laughs> and I'm trying to just relax and picture a positive outcome. I'm just trying to visualize the best outcome. And I'm alone in my hospital room. And the minute I do that, I pop right out of my body uh, the minute I visualize best outcome. And I was a little surprised at first. And then I like look back at myself uh, over my left shoulder and I see myself in the hospital bed and I start uh, talking about myself and thinking of myself in third person. It's like, oh my gosh, she's whiter than a ghost. Oh, wow. She's in really bad shape. Look at that. But I was like, oh, I feel wonderful. No more pain, no more, you know, desperation, no more being scared. I feel fantastic. And I could see this white light above me coming down from um, the ceiling of the hospital room. So it's like, I'm going up there. She's fine. Again, I'm a little bit concerned. I'm so blasé about me. But I'm realizing I'm in pure soul form, and that's only a temporary housing. That's only an aspect of me. And right now, I'm just going to say she's safe in the bed, and I'm going up because this light is compelling. So I start floating up to see what it is. It's almost like being magnetically drawn there. And I did pause for a second because I'm like, oh, gosh, I hope I don't have to walk through one of those long tunnels the minute I thought that, as I'm like, I'm just too tired. I don't think I can walk through or float through a long tunnel. The minute I thought it, this beautiful escalator came in for me. And no one else is on it. It's pristine. There's so much light coming up from it. And I'm like, ugh. And I like just roll myself onto the escalator and go up and up and up. And I could feel like I was resting. 
And the moment I got to the top of this escalator, it went so far and I could look back below me. I could see the hospital building. I could see the grounds. I could start to see the town. I'm like seeing from further and further up, but I don't really care. It's like, yeah, I'm oriented. I'm much more interested in what's above and more interested in the light. The moment I get to the top of the escalator, there's this welcoming committee. So the same angels were there and Archangel Michael was speaking again, but also there was soul family there. There was my soul group. All four of my grandparents were there and I was so excited because they were so thrilled to see me and they all give me this huge group hug and say, welcome home. We're so glad you're here. You've done nothing wrong is what uh, Michael said. And you are welcome to stay. So I'm like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Because I can't wait to have more of a reunion. And I can't wait to see everything else. But I can't really see because they're crowded at the top of that escalator. And I later realized they were holding me back. So there's about 20 of them there. And Michael says, you're going to need to choose quickly. It is absolutely your choice, but if you want to go back, I can tell you three things to help you make your decision. Number one, uh, if you have the uh, surgery tomorrow, it will be successful and you will fully recover your health. That's number one. Number two, your baby will be born healthy. So these are two huge things and I'm feeling like, you know, the weight of the world coming off me. And number three was the zinger. Number three was if you go back, your life will be very difficult, likely for many years because you are not on your life path. You are not living your purpose. What do you want to do? So of course I want more information. <laughs> I'm horrified to hear I'm 36 years old. I'm horrified to hear I'm not doing the right thing. I'm not on my life path. I'm not living my purpose. So of course I ask him, I'm like, well, what, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I missing? What do I need to change? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What should I be doing? And he just shook his head. And it wasn't unkind in any way, but there was no way he was going to share more information. So I look around at the others and I think, oh, come on, there's got to be a chatty Kathy in the group. <laughs> Someone's got to give it up. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking around, I'm looking at my four grandparents and they start being silly and they're putting like duct tape over their mouths. They're like pretending they're like uh, locking their mouth and they're throwing the key away. And, just, and I'm like, okay, I need to settle down. I'm not going to get any more information. I just need to be grateful for this experience because it changes everything. Because to feel that unconditional love, it was, it was just mind-blowing. As I said, it changed everything to feel that that support was available. And I want everybody to know it is available to all of us. It's part of the human condition to feel alone, abandoned, frustrated, overwhelmed. That's part of the human condition. Ask for help because uh, guides and angels cannot help us without us asking. Why don't we just jump right in it then and mm -hmm. you tell us about what happened back in uh, 2021 of December. The week before, um, I had broken my ankle when I was roller skating, and due to the um, regular the health regulations they currently have in Melbourne, my husband was unable to visit me for a whole week in hospital. So I was pretty much in there by myself with a broken leg, um, lightly um, straightened and stuff until I get the major surgery on the seventeenth. And so I went down to um, get ready for my surgery at about. 9am and things all the nurses and the doctors were lovely and then um I was ready for my and then I was under it I was under at about 10 and my operation finished about 12 30. Um, during this operation um they were they were repairing my fibula and tibula so I've got um plates and screws on both sides of my right ankle at the moment and um that's what the surgery did so I 
got out of the surgery at about 12 30. Um, I was knocked out until about 2 2 p.m um 2 2 30 p.m and my nurse who was by my side had said that I was having um seizures during my um during being um unconscious I was still having these seizures um, when I had woken up, the reason I was having these seizures is I suffer from PNES, which is psychogenetic non-epileptic seizures. Um, it's a fairly new term. There wasn't a term for this, I would say, about um, 15 years ago because I had the same experience when I had to get my wisdom teeth out when um, due to PNES. Yet when I had woken up at about 2.30, um, I was still having these seizures, but I was awake. And they were happening every minute for about 30 seconds. And they were like full on seizures. I had no control of them. Um, and then they were slowly getting longer. So it would go from one every minute um, to every two minutes to every three minutes. And then by about 3.30, my seizures were happening about every three, mi um, every three minutes for about 30 seconds. And then they moved me up from recovery to my own ward, um, into my own room, because I, I suffer from asthma. If I'm having seizures on and off for like three and a half hours, my lungs were um, struggling to keep the oxygen in. And then I started feeling this pain along here, like my heart was giving. And my nurse, because she was very in tune with me, she was so beautiful. Like I swear she was an angel um, to help me guide me back to earth that day. Like she was holding my hand and she was so lovely. Um, and sorry, I got lost in that kind thought. Um, and um, she was like, I, what's going on here I'm like, I'm like I'm starting to feel pain here in my heart something's wrong I can't I can't breathe properly my heart feels like it's about to explode and then the next minute they call something over the hospital speaker it's some big code and then next minute 15 nurses and doctors just come running into my room um oh, just standing God. around me um trying to get me to breathe trying to control my heart and this is when this experience started happening because my heart was going and things and um I was looking up at the ceiling I started seeing this amber orb so if any of you know anything about ghost spirituality or anything um there is a point where we are orbs um after passing and stuff and so I saw this amber orb floating up and it was just hovering above me and then as that was happening, I was seeing um, different perspectives from where I was. So I was seeing behind the nurses who were holding my hand and seeing the doctors that were at the far side, like they were, I couldn't see them properly from where I was lying down. So I could see from their perspective and I just saw from altering perspectives and from above and below. And I just saw this amber light just floating. And I was like, I was like, I could tell that something was happening because I'm very in tune with my body. And I believe the universe gives me clues of what's happening. Um, and then I was like, this doesn't feel right, but I trust the universe. So I'm just going to go with it, with it. And there was one point where my heart was slowly draining and I was like going in, like, you know, when you open and close a torch and it slowly gets lighter and brighter mm -hmm. and things like that. That's what I was seeing. And then at this point, I, I went to my lovely nurse who was my angel that day. And I said to her in tears, I'm like, I don't want to die. And she, she, she had tears in her eyes as well um, because it was just so intense. This was at a 3.5 3, 3 hour mark, four hour mark that this was happening. Mm -hmm. And this was going on from 3.30 to about 5.30. So this was a two hour um, ordeal. I didn't know how long it was going for during the time just because I was seeing this amber light and just seeing perspectives of everyone. And then as my heart was straining and straining and my lungs were struggling to get any bit of oxygen in I did I call it a desk a death gasp and I went <gasps> and I shot up and then at some point these two light beings come down and they hold their hands over my body as I'm lying like you pray over someone that is sick and this white orb that was the same color as them just surrounded me and them and there was no one else that could come in and my, this little amber orb was inside this sphere. And then as they were praying over me, it floated back down into here. And then I came through and it was like nothing. It was like, I was just like, hi guys. I hope you know I'm going out of hospital tomorrow because I've been there in, for a week. And I was like, now we've gone through that. I just want you to know I'm still going out of hospital tomorrow. It was, it was like I had been re-energized and um, they were astounded by that. 
So that was during the NDE experience, but I had to stay in that room that night and things. And um, I don't know how much your audience know about energies and frequencies and stuff. If there's anything, um, when, when you go near the veil, I call the veil, which is what I saw um, when you're nearly dying, um, a lot of energy escapes through and stuff. So it's like, so it's like a little, um, I say, uh, let's put it as a drawbridge, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a little drawbridge. When the veil is broken, this drawbridge, drawbridge slowly comes um, down and whoever's on the other side or energies can come in. And because I was a receptor from the veil to the human world, um, a lot of this energy had escaped into me. And during that night, so many ghosts, and spirits were visiting me that had been in the hospital and um I was this was like I was sleeping but because I can lucid dream I I can keep notes of what's happening and this one was like I felt um I'm so glad I've got someone to talk to I've I've been by myself for ages and it's like that's all right um come and talk to me you know I've got this the veils open to be talked to let's take time to just chat to each other and these just people like they were just shadows just coming and talking and we could talk through energy telepathy yeah mm. <laughs> telepathy and um and I could understand them they could understand me and I was just I was worn out the next day because to be in a place in in this room think of it as a chamber to be in this room where all this energy has come in from another world with nowhere to escape, where's it going to go in that, day, in that day? And especially at hospitals where there's a lot of death and sadness. When my nurses were, um, nurses and doctors were trying to um, slow down my heart and everything, a phone kept ringing. I could hear what they were saying. They said, who keeps ringing the phone? We can't answer. We can't answer the phone. Who keeps ringing? And they were calling every 10 minutes or so from 3.30 to 5.15. And, um, I thought it was just a trippy thing going on during that whole moment. But when I got out of hospital the next day, I told him, because I didn't tell my husband exactly what happened until I saw him. And I said, you know what was happening when I was going through that? I was hearing a phone ring and they couldn't pick it up. They had to hang it up. And he's like, that was probably me because I was trying to call you from 3.30 to 5.30 into in your to your room and I could just hear that and I think that's another thing that the universe kind of this is how I trusted the universe because all for my whole time of um being in hospital all the nurses and doctors were lovely even my an anesthesiologist and my surgeons they were all lovely and I just feel like these little people were put into my life just to show that I could trust the universe and I trusted the universe the whole time through that and just the calls from my husband I think that's just a earth thing that's in tune with what was happening at the time mm -hmm. um also a bit of a spooky dooky thing that happened is for the whole of 2021 I had a feeling that I was gonna die I didn't share this with my husband until the week before my accident and I said to him because it was the end of it was December so I was like oh it's just it's almost the end of the year I can say this to him now and I said you know what I had a funny idea that I was going to die this year but because it's almost the end of December I thought I'd just tell you and it was just a passing comment and then just a week after that happens and it's not the first time I've been um in tune with people dying tell us about your near-death experience well the near-death ex experience happened um I used to work quite late in my shop and finally got to the point to where my wife was getting very upset and she finally put her foot down and said okay you know no more late nights at the shop you know be home by midnight so one night I was sitting down in the shop and I was cleaning up my shop rags I was rinse I was washing them in one one bucket rinsing them in another bucket been doing this for probably maybe 40 minutes or something like that I had a whole pile and I was running out of rags after about 40 minutes I get all these rags cleaned up to stretch my back and when I did that, all of a sudden I started getting these light tracers in my eyes, these light flashes and these zipping lines going, going across. And I felt like I was going to faint, made my way over to my office. I glanced off of the door jam. I was losing, I was losing more sight. I bumped into a filing cabinet. They had a bunch of paperwork that was on top of it. I headed face first right onto the concrete floor and I never felt a thing. I think before I was hit, I was yanked 
out of my body. I flew through two walls and I ended up in a black void. Completely dark, pitch black. It was warm. Um, it felt like vermiculite potting soil. You know, it had like the little mica things in it. It had no gravity in it. Um, I couldn't tell which position I was positioned in, whether I was upside down or, or right side up or, or what. At one point, I reached for my right arm with my left arm and I never found it. So this is when I pretty much surmised that, that I was dead. Laying in the dirt was something because as soon as as soon as I got into the dirt, it was it was warm for one. It was it felt really cozy, and the other thing it was full of love. You could feel the love in the dirt. You knew the dirt wasn't from from anywhere else. The dirt was from heaven. You just knew that it was like an all knowing an all knowing love, not the kind of love like you love your wife or you know you love your dog or something. This was like a different kind of love, an all-knowing love. I was just surprised by all of this. So I was in there for quite a while. And about this time, I'm thinking that, you know, well, maybe, you know, I know someone's going to come and get me, you know, so I'm just laying here. All of a sudden, poof, I'm back into my shop, come, to, come in through the wall. And this time I'm up by the ceiling. I can, I can look down, I can see the buckets, I can see the rag, I can see everything in my shop my table saw I'm floating towards the office door and I could see the filing cabinet was tilted over all the paperwork that was on top of it was on the floor uh, everything was really vivid I could see all the colors on the, on the invoices when the stores give you an invoice sometimes you get the white copy or the type you know and then you get the or some people give you the yellow copy or the pink copy I could see all the colors I could see the names of the, in, of the people from the companies of the invoices don't remember but I know I had my stereo on, and I don't remember if I had um, hearing or not. As I looked at every all the mess that I made, like as I was looking down, I could see myself on the floor, face down. My glasses were broken. A big pile of dried blood coming out of the side of my mouth. There was a tooth laying there too. And when I looked at myself, it was I was starting to be drawn, not pushed or pulled, but drawn like magnetics. I was being pulled in at the back of my head, and when I when the spark that I was ended up into the back of my head. These two huge hands, I mean, big wide hands, slid underneath my torso and they picked me up and raised me, raised me to my knees. Or actually, they slid underneath me and I heard this voice that said, come off of the floor. And the hands raised me to my knees. So I reached out my right arm and I set my elbow on the desk so I could steady myself. And I turned to my left to see who, see who'd pick me up. And there was no one there. And I also realized that I crapped my pants. Because I guess when you go, you go. Yes. I looked at my watch to see how long I'd been, been out. And when I was washing my rags and I stood up, you know, to stretch my back, it was 1143. And when I got raised to my knees in my office, I looked at my watch to see how long I'd been out. And it was 207. I've been out of, bo I've been out of body for two hours and 18 minutes. So I get cleaned up. I put on some, uh, I put on a pair of shop coveralls that I had, started heading up to the house, grabbed a stick so I could use it as a walking stick and get cleaned up, took a shower and uh, put on some clean sweats. I went and laid down on my bed and I think I got a couple hours worth of sleep. All of a sudden I woke up and I had my, my mouth was flooding with water, like right before you get ready to, you know, hurl chunks. Got off my bed, headed down, headed down the hallway towards the bathroom. And the light tracers came back. They were zipping all over in my eyes. I was getting little flashes and poofs and stuff. And I went over to my recliner and I sat down. And I yelled at my wife and I said, Polly, get up, get up. Bring me a pot. I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get sick. Well, she comes running in, not knowing what the hell's going on. Um, she had no clue of anything that was going on down the shop. And she can't figure out why I can't stand up. And I said, I can't, you know, I can't stand up. I can't see. And she said, what? You know, how is this going on? So, yeah, I bring me a pot. So she brings me a pot. And I get sick and it's all blown. Well, there's the panic time into the car. We head on up to uh, Newport, 12 miles away. We just jumped in the car because we figured it would be faster to have it than to call the ambulance and have them take less time when we could just jump in the car and go. So we, we headed up to Newport. And once we get up to there, they did a CAT scan on me and they found the, the vein. And then they realized that there was no one in the hospital there that could do the job. So they loaded me up with a six pack of blood 
and a, uh, a pack of syrup and a six pack uh, and a pack of platelets threw me in an ambulance and then shipped me off to a hospital that was 46 miles away. And when we got uh, we got over to that hospital, uh, the doctor, the radiologist that was there was young. He was a new uh, radiologist. Um, but anyway, I was a hell of a case. My liver had cirrhosis, you know, bad. And uh, all my veins were varicose. He tried three different times to uh, to repair the stent. And when you we, when you go to repair the stent, they put a uh, they put a, lot, uh, a a tube down your jugular vein, and it runs all the way down to the organ. And they just they're watching on a radio screen. You're laying on an electric, you know, on an X-ray table, and they're just putting they put trace dye in you, and they're just watching this thing go down. And they're taking pictures all the way in, and all this stuff. And he couldn't. Uh, he tried three different times to get it to stick, and he couldn't do it. The head doctor comes out and tells Polly that uh, my wife that uh, about the best thing they can do for me is keep me comfortable. Just keep me comfortable. Well, she asked how long I'd been how long I'd been drinking, and Polly said, "Well, he hasn't he hasn't had a drink in uh, he hasn't had a hadn't had a drink in eight years." And she goes, "Oh," I said, "Well, how?" He says, "What about smoking?" She says. Well, he only smokes like two cigarettes a day, if that. And she goes, oh my goodness. So she goes on in to her, to her office. And she goes, oh my, you know, and runs on into her office. And she's, and when she runs into her office, all of a sudden I'm encapsulated in this blue tube. It was, it was thick. It was like a, about an inch and a half thick. Um, it was mottled. It wasn't smooth on the outside. Um, you could see through it. It was definitely blue. Um, I could see, I could make out everything that was going on. I, I had hearing, I could hear everything. I could hear uh, my wife, um, the doctor had called uh, the head gastroen gastroenterologist at OHSU in Portland. And he said, put him in the tube, take a picture of his liver and see if he has any tumors on it. If he doesn't, put him on my roof. Well, it looked like I was going to be uh, medevaced or, or life lighted to uh, OHSU. But when this tube formed over me, there were these four souls inside. They were about the size of your fist, a little pointy on one end, maybe. There was a semblance of a face, but not a true face. They all spoke at once. They spoke to me telepathically. They all spoke at once. I could understand everything they were saying. I could understand everything everybody was saying on the outside of the tube. I could understand my wife, Polly. I could understand the doctor. I could understand them talking uh, amongst themselves. The four souls said to me, oh boy, here we go. Um, they said, you can't go, you have to stay. You are protected and you are loved. And when they said the word love, this ring emanated from is like a shock wave. If you've watched a, an atomic bomb blow up on a desert and that first quick, poof, that first quick wave you see, mm -hmm. that's what it looked like. And it was in slow motion and it was coming towards me and coming towards me. And when it hit my body, my face and my torso, when I hit it, that was that was the most unbelievable love I ever felt in my life. Uh, it beat it beat the void, uh, you know. It beat the dirt. It was I'd never felt anything like that. You can actually see love coming. I could see. So it, it's it's an it's an actual thing.